Hey everybody, it's good to be back with you and we do want to give a little shout out to our granddaughters. We just spent some time with them this afternoon. Uh, Mia and Abby, how are y'all doing? Good to see you. I hope you're asleep by now. We're doing this, of course, on Saturday night and a little later uh, than normal simply because we spent the <laughs> afternoon over there. Later. But this is the beginning of a new quarter uh, and we're studying Isaiah this quarter. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the book of Isaiah before we actually get into uh, the lesson for the week, but there are only 10 verses and it's it's a good lesson, but we do want to spend some time letting you know more about the book of Isaiah. You know, I'm going to begin with a little story uh, I heard about uh, a nervous bride and uh, uh, she was just so nervous she couldn't, couldn't keep things straight in her mind and she told her father about this and uh, so he said, honey, all you got to do is remember three things. First, we're going to walk down the aisle. Uh, and a second thing is just remember we're going to head up to the altar. And then the third thing, when we get down there, we're going to sing a hymn. So just remember those things and you should be fine. Well, uh, as she was walking down the aisle and as she got to the front of the church, everybody heard her saying, I'll altar him. I'll altar him. I'll altar him. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like I'll alter him. I yeah. don't know. And when we try to alter someone to meet our expectations, you know, sometimes we don't know what the expectations of other people are and we get ourselves in trouble. For example, the church Daniel and I served in Huntsville had expectations that neither one of us were aware of. They did not think that staff wives needed to work. They felt that they compensated the staff well enough that the staff wife would not work. And so when we moved there in August, John was four months old and I didn't have time to apply for a teaching job. Mm -hmm. And so the first year we were there, I stayed home with John. And so after that first year, the next summer rolled around and I applied for a teaching job. And believe me, there were some rough moments with that church. Yeah, uh, the deacons were not happy with the the fact that I thought I needed to work, and it yeah. wasn't that I needed to work; it was what it was right. I wanted to work. Yeah, we always so. felt like you know I was called to ministry, and she was called to be a teacher, and uh, for them to deny her that right is something we didn't think should happen. Of course, she did get a teaching job, and she taught every year after that. And there was not a whole lot of other problems right. after that. But, you know, problems and conflict can erupt in any area of life when people don't know the expectations that others have for them. Mm -hmm. But if the expectations are known, what happens if the people don't live up to them? Right. And that's kind of what the focus of today's Bible study is. This lesson centers on the failure of God's people to meet God's divine expectations. You know, as I mentioned before, before we move into the lesson, we're going to get acquainted with some background information I call it an Isaiah preview and uh, you know so we can kind of understand Isaiah a little better and the times he was he was uh, writing his prophecy in Sir Winston Churchill once was once asked to give the qualifications a person needed to succeed in politics and he said it's the ability to foretell what is going to happen tomorrow next week next month next year and to have the ability afterwards to explain why it didn't happen because God's prophets are correct all the time, they didn't have to explain their mistakes. We're going to start off with that the name Isaiah means salvation of the Lord. And salvation or deliverance is the key theme of this book. He wrote during five different acts of, uh, concerning five different acts of deliverance that God would perform. The first one was the deliverance of Judah from the Assyrian invasion in chapters 36 and 37. The deliverance of the nation from Babylonian captivity in chapter 40. The future deliverance of the Jews from worldwide dispersion among the Gentiles in chapters 11 and 12. In chapter 53, he talked about the deliverance of lost sinners from judgment. And then in chapters 60 and 66, the final deliverance of creation from the bondage of sin when the kingdom is established. You know, there are other men, Jewish men named Isaiah. So the prophet identified himself seven times as the son of Amos, A-M-O-Z, mm -hmm. not to be confused with Amos, A-M-O-S. Isaiah was married and his wife was called a prophetess in chapter uh, 8, verse 3. And that was either because she was married to a prophet or maybe she shared in the prophetic gift. 
Now, uh, they, <laughs> he fathered two sons whose names were <clears throat> Shir Jashub, which meant a remnant shall return, and Maher Shalash Hasbaz, which of course is the longest name in the Bible, which means quick to plunder, swift to spoil. The two names speak of the nation's judgment and restoration, two important themes in Isaiah's prophecy. Just a little bit of trivia. There is an actor uh, currently, his name, he has shortened his name, but his name when he was born was Maher Shalash Hasbaz Gilbert. Now he's called Maher Shalash uh, Ali, because he, you know, is a Muslim now, but he's he's a very famous actor. He's won two Oscars. Uh, we probably remember him best for the role of the Colonel in uh, Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures, who yeah. married uh, Catherine Johnson later on. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad Daniel had those names and not me, because I just said long name. All right. So back to Isaiah. Isaiah was a man who hated sin and sham religion. His favorite name for God is the Holy One of Israel, and he uses it 25 times in his book. Compared to, it's only used five other times in the old, the rest of the Old Testament. He looked at the crowded courts of the temple, and in chapter 1, verse 4, he said, O oh, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, brood of evildoers, depraved children. They have abandoned the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they have turned their backs on him. And when he talked, looked at the political policies of the leaders in Isaiah 31, 1, he said, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. They do not look to the Holy One of Israel. They do not seek the Lord. God was holy, but the nation was sinful, and Isaiah was calling the people to repent. You know, Isaiah was a man skilled in communicating God's truth. He wasn't content with merely declaring fact. He clothed these facts with striking language that would catch the people's attention. And he compared the nation to a diseased body, a harlot, a useless vineyard, a bulging wall that was about to fall down, and a woman in travail. Assyria, the enemy that would come attack them, would be like a swollen stream, a swarm of bees, a lion, and an axe. And just like Jesus, Isaiah knew how to stir the people's imagination so they would listen and he could teach them about God's truth. Okay. Now, you know, just to see the time when Isaiah was prophesying, uh, you know, if you read the beginning of the book, it says in the year that Uzziah died. So we know that uh, he was prophesying during the end of Uzziah, who's also known as Azariah. Uh, and as a, he's an unusual, I mean, he, he was, you know, he really had a long reign, but early in his reign, he was a good, a good king. But towards the end, uh, he tried to take over for the priest and God gave him leprosy. Yeah. So he was a bad king at the end. And Jotham, his son, who kind of uh, had worked with him and then took over for him when he, he died, uh, was a good king. Uh, he did he did the things that God wanted him to do, uh, but the next king Ahaz. We all know about Ahaz. He was a bad king, yeah. uh, and he was really really a bad king. And uh, once again, Isaiah's prophesying during that time. And then finally, Hezekiah was a uh, a great king. Yeah. You know, one of the best kings after the the split. And uh, but you know after after Hezekiah, there are no more godly kings that that ruled in judah traditions say that the next king i didn't put his name down here manasseh who was hezekiah's successor actually killed isaiah by having him sawed in half now we don't have any record of that in scripture but there is uh talk in you know the faith chapter what it talks about uh, the great men that some were killed by being sawed in half yeah. so anyway that's kind of uh that's kind of where we are are with that and another thing I want to share with you about that, you know, I've heard this for years that Isaiah is called the mini Bible. The reason being it's got 66 chapters and of course the Bible has 66 books and there's really a natural division between uh, chapter 39 and chapter 40 and you know the Old Testament has 39 books and the New Testament has 27 books and so it really just kind of works out that way. Another thing that's interesting, and I learned this a long time ago, and it's just fascinated me, and I don't have to, we don't have time to read it to you, but I want you to look up on your own 2 Kings 19, 
and Isaiah 37, those two chapters are identical, word for word. If you go back and forth, you can read them, and they do exactly the same thing. You know, there's also a little bit more about Isaiah. We think that the book of Isaiah was a favorite of Paul. Paul quoted it or alluded to it at least 80 times in his epistles and at least in three of his recorded messages. This interest may stem from the fact that Jesus quoted Isaiah 42, 7 when he spoke to Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul's call to evangelize the Gentiles was confirmed by Isaiah 49, 6. And like the prophet Isaiah, Paul saw the vastness of God's plan for both Jews and Gentiles. And like Isaiah, Paul magnified Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Five times in his letters, Paul referred to Isaiah 53. In fact, Isaiah's servant song about Jesus in Isaiah 52 and 53 is quoted or alluded to nearly 40 times in the New Testament. And that's just a little bit of an introduction. Right. So now we need to start looking at our lesson today. And of course... Uh, you know, we showed you this at the beginning. We're looking today at Isaiah 1, verses 10 through 20. And, uh, you know, uh, we're going to begin with our Facebook question. And uh, the question was, what is something that you took for granted before the COVID-19 pandemic, but you don't now? So, Beth Edwards said, going out to eat. Uh, Jamie Moody, shaking hands or hugging. Rose Travis, standing beside someone. Yep. Hannah Zerbel said, big holiday parties. And I don't know what holiday she's talking about, Mm -hmm. but the ones we normally go to haven't happened yet. Yeah. Steve Laster said, all being together as a church family under one roof. Uh, Sylvia Wheeler says, hugging my mother and grandmother. Alice Bonchev said, visiting my mom in the nursing home. Yeah, you know, Alice's mom actually had COVID-19. Yeah. Never really had any symptoms, but she was diagnosed with it. Okay, Darla Davis actually gave us two answers, but I've combined them. Visiting nursing home, family and friend gatherings, and then traveling vacations. Nancy Spur said, having time with my sister. Uh, yeah. Uh, Annie Smith said, going to church and making quick trip to the grocery store. Todd Slaughter said, eating breakfast every Friday with the old guys. There's a lot to be learned from them. Yeah, there's a group of old guys that meets for lunch at Cracker Barrel every every Friday morning. Okay, Ellen Roberts said, flying to Dallas. Teresa Laster said, my neighbors. Judy Rogers said, eating out and traveling. Amanda Henley said, traveling anywhere I wanted to go. Uh, And Steve, Catherine Dillon, one of them, said, seeing smiling faces without a mask. Judy McGee said, freedom that allows me to hug those I care for, gather with friends anywhere, eat out, fresh air rather than mask air, seeing smiles on others' faces, and the list can go on and on. Okay, so do you know what you've missed? Probably teaching Sunday school in a classroom. (laughs) Yeah, uh, really, seriously. (laughs) And I've missed cruises. Uh, You know, we enjoy going on cruises, and we really wouldn't have gone on one yet. But they're canceled for some time to come. So, you know, you're not able to do that. So today we're going to look at the scripture in three sections. And the first section, you know, uh, the whole passage, well, we're looking at Isaiah 1, 10 through 15 first. And Isaiah tells the people that they were rebellious. And so this is what he said in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are all your sacrifices to me, asked the Lord. I have enough of your burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, or male goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires this from you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbath, the calling of solemn assemblies, I cannot stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They become a burden to me. I am tired of putting up with them. Wow. When you spread your out your hands in prayer, I refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Oof. So we're going to call this section Rebuke. We see that God is less than thrilled with the worship that he's receiving. 
he says that basically the people were just going through the motions. And when he addresses Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 10, we think of, well, we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. You know, we think of only one sin, sexual immorality. But Ezekiel tells us in chapter 16 that it was about their haughtiness. Yeah. You know, uh, before we pass judgment on the worshipers in the bygone era, researcher George Barner reports that 93% of households in the U.S. have a Bible and more than 60% of the people claim to be religious. One Protestant church exists for every 550 adults in America. Now, does this make much difference in a religion, in a sinful society? Not really. But we still have the same crime rate or the entertainment for the as, as folks that don't, that aren't religious countries. So, you know, the, the, there's a difference between being religious and being a Christian nation. And, and on a more personal note, how's your worship? You know, is it pleasing to God? We see how he reacted to the worship that they were giving him. You know, too many of us think that when we go to church or when we're worshiping, that we're the audience because we're sitting out, you know, out down off the stage uh, and the people on the stage are the are the worshipers, but basically God's the audience. That's how it should be. And the people on stage are leading us to worship, but the main worshipers are the people that are sitting out uh, in the regular seats in the sanctuary. It's pretty obvious here that God doesn't like these uh, meaningless worship that sometimes we have. Now, we get a clue in the next two verses about why our worship uh, could be better uh, when we're when we're talking about God, and that would be verses. 16 and 17 and it says wash yourselves cleanse yourselves remove your evil deeds from my sight stop doing evil learn to do what is good pursue justice correct the oppressor defend the rights of the fatherless plead the widow's cause you know we are going to call this section restore look at the verbs which will show us how we can restore wash yourselves Cleanse yourselves sounds it's sounds like it's appropriate for the pandemic, yeah. but it's related to ritual cleansing in their sacrificial system. These other things are all things we can do to restore our proper relationship with God. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what's good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. So, you see all these verbs are action words telling us things to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, then we look at Isaiah 1, 18 through 20, and it says, Come, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat of the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We're going to call this section uh, results. And, uh, you know, the King James Version, if we look at it, doesn't say, you know, let's settle this. It says, come, let us reason together. But they mean the same thing, you know. In our, in our vernacular today, when we want something to be decided, we say, let's settle this. Uh, you know, we see the sacrificial system as it should be. It talks about our sins being... Uh, as scarlet and they shall be white as snow though they are crimson they'll be as wool you know that's that's kind of what the sacrificial system was for in their day but we can kind of see it in the new testament as what jesus did for us and uh, how his sacrifice provided forgiveness for our sins you know it reminds me of something that i read actually on facebook some time ago and it made a big big impact on me so I shared it at BBS I want to share it with y'all now Jonathan Edwards who preached during the first uh, Great Awakening in the United States from about the 1730s to the 1770s before the, the you know the War of Independence he said you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary and that's so true you know nothing we do can save us uh, it's all provided for us we just have to accept it but we are the the sin that showed us that we needed to do that. You know, verse 19 and 20, I, I think uh, it's interesting that we're back to what we, we saw in Proverbs, where we, remember we were talking about those if-then statements? I can't remember what those called. What are they called? They're called conditionals. Okay. You know, it has an if, and then, a, you know, it has a consequence right. afterward. 
you know, it says, if you are willing and obedient, then you'll eat of the good things of the mm-hmm. land. But if you refuse and rebel, then you'll be devoured by the sword. God is calling out his people in this passage and setting the stage for the rest of this book of prophecy. Okay, let's move on to our weekly challenge. The first thing is I want you to do some more background study on Isaiah. You might think we told you everything there is to know, but (laughs) you won't even know how much stuff we left out. Okay, second thing is to examine your worship. Some of you are coming to worship with us, but most of you that are watching this are not, and that's fine. But however you're worshiping, examine it to make sure that God is the audience. And here's something that's kind of us, for us personally. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to both be teaching in the classroom. And uh, so if you want us to continue to do these videos, we're not saying uh, that we're stopping doing those. But unless someone wants us to do it, we we don't see any reason in continuing to do it. Uh, But you have to email us. The email address, danieldykes at conwaycorp.net. Let me know sometime this week, hopefully early in the week as soon as you watch this let me know uh so yes, we can please continue it yes or, or, or uh, if, you, if you don't want to if you don't want to continue we don't have to hear from you okay all right and then next sunday of course we're calling it comeback sunday and uh, we have uh, a worship service at 8 30 a.m then sunday school at 9 45 i think i had that wrong on the video last week but that's sunday school for all ages not just adults but for preschoolers all the way up through adults and then at 11 o'clock the uh, second worship service. If you're early risers, I would encourage you to come to that 8.30 service. There's a lot of room at 8.30. Mm -hmm. The 11 o'clock service has been being kind of crowded, but since we started Sunday school, uh, if you were gonna come to Sunday school, you could not come to the the nine o'clock service because you wouldn't be be done in time to get to Sunday school. So hopefully some people will move and start coming earlier. But uh, I know we're kind of going on and on. But we're excited about uh, everything starting back up. Of course, cautious. Uh, we want people to wear masks if they're coming. And, uh, you know, we're going to have the room set up so that you can work on being socially distanced. I think we're calling that now instead of socially distanced to reasonably distanced because uh, we can't always provide that six feet. But if you've got your mask on and you're a few feet away, you should be okay. All right. Let's close with a word of prayer today. Father, we thank you for. Uh, the book of Isaiah. We thank you for the challenge it's going to give us this quarter. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity we've had to give a preview. And also this first lesson, Father, how it it, it just kind of pricks our heart and lets us know that that any worship to you is not worthy, that we have to be focused and our worship has to truly see you as the audience. So Father, I pray that we'll be doing that in, in our times of worship. I pray that you be with each of us as we make decisions on what we're going to do about being back next week. And I know we have some still have some slots that need to be filled. And I just pray that you be with the folks that you've already decided are going to fill those spots and have them to give us those good answers. And Lord, I just pray that you be with every person that's watching this and bless them. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching. Maybe the last time or maybe not.